Anyway, I, I'm going to invite Kevin and Christy Rhodes to come up, and they're going to read our scripture for us this morning. And as they come up, I, I want to encourage us. Uh, this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 that we're going to be looking into is, for some people, not a joyful passage to read or to, to listen to. And for you, if you're single this morning, if you haven't been married yet and you're single and, and you know, you're hoping to one day get married, I, I hope that you don't tune out, but yet you stick with us through this passage as we study together 1 Peter chapter 3, the first couple of verses. And hopefully you'll be able to take something out of this as a future husband or a future wife uh, to be able to help shape you into uh, the spouse that you need to be, that God has designed you to be uh, in your marriage. If you are married and uh, you're having a great marriage and great, I hope that you can take something from this this morning uh, to encourage your marriage and, and continue to help it thrive. But I know this. There are people here who have been married and now they're divorced or they're in their marriage and it's really rocky and it doesn't seem like there's any hope. Don't check out on me, please. My mom is a victim of divorce and I'm not saying that she was perfect. By no means am I saying that she was perfect. And she hurt through that, absolutely. And the last thing she wanted to do was to sit around and listen to some guy stand up on the stage and talk about marriage because it hurt, there was pain, real pain. But she had three young boys that she had to raise on her own. And so rather than suffer through that pain, she found healing, allowed people to surround her, a church family to surround her and encourage her and to get through that because she wanted to make sure that her boys heard God's word and understood what it was to be in a healthy marriage. Because she knows that what was modeled for her boys was not healthy. What was modeled for her from her parents was not healthy. What was modeled for my dad's, from my dad's parents, it, it wasn't healthy. So she chose to endure that. So I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you to consider enduring another message on marriage and what it is to be a wife and what it is to be a husband for your benefit that you might find healing but also for the benefit of your kids that they might understand a healthy marriage and break the vicious cycle that is what we call divorce. That's my appeal to you this morning. So I'm going to ask them to read. Christy's going to read 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, the first five verses. And then Kevin's going to read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 30. So go ahead. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the beauty, I'm sorry, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing the wa with water through the word, and to present herself, or her, to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, and after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. All right. Amen. Thank you all. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can learn from it. And Lord, I know that sometimes reading your word is painful. Sometimes your word penetrates in a very sensitive area in our lives. But God, we also know that your word brings healing. You bring healing. And so, Father, I pray that as we study your word this morning, that you would begin the process of healing, begin the process of restoration. Because we all have hurts and pains in our lives from our past. And so, God, we pray that today you would restore us, heal our hurts, make us whole that, Father, we can live a life that is fruitful in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So here we are, 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to get one thing out of the way so that we're all on the same page uh, as we go through this. There are three words in there that I want us to, to concentrate on uh, as we begin. There are four words, in the same way. Verse 1 of chapter 3, wives in the same way. Verse 7 of chapter 3, husbands in the same way. Those four words are pretty significant. Why? Because referring to the way Christ gave himself up for the church. They're referring to the way that Christ modeled a servant life for his father in front of us. And so Peter writes these words in the same way, keeping in mind that in the same way as Jesus for the wife and for the husband, in the same way. We need to trust God and we need to have an attitude of humility to one another in the same way as Jesus. In chapter two, verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. In the same way that we do good, that we respect God, that we honor him with our lives, that we would silence the ignorant, that we would silence those who do not yet understand or know God that they do not yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ as their savior. So as we see these words in the same way, may it be a reflection of Jesus. Verse one, wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands. Just as Jesus was submissive to his father's will, so the wife should be submissive to her husband. But let me make it very clear that submissive is not about slavery. Submissiveness is not about a hired hand. Wife, you are not your husband's slave. Let me make that very clear. Let me repeat it again. Wife, you are not your husband's slave. So if your husband sat back in his chair and got all comfortable because he thought, yes, finally she's going to get it. No. You, as a wife, are to submit to your husband as respect to God. And not in an uncharacteristic and ungodly manner do you submit to your husband, nor does he act in an ungodly manner. But you submit to him out of reverence to God, that you honor and that you respect your husband. Because he has a great reality of being the head of the wife being the leader, a huge responsibility, a responsibility that comes from God. So husbands, don't get comfortable because I'm coming after you next, right? Be submissive. And then it says to your husbands, later translations say your husbands, other translations add the word own. The new version of the NIV, the newer, newer version of the NIV says your own husband. In other words, it's communicating the idea that there is singularity in a marriage, one man and one woman, one husband and one wife. And in Genesis chapter two, it says that a man will leave his mother and his father and he will be united with his wife and the two will become one. Hallelujah. And so Peter writes in there, your own husband. I'm imagining that this letter is being read to a crowd kind of like this, a mixture of people. And so he's addressing wives as the, the plural, the, the multitude, and he's addressing husbands as the plural and the multitude. Listen, you husbands and you wives need to have a, a relationship that is Christ-centered. And then he focuses on the possibility. Wives, you may have husbands that are not quite yet in a relationship with Jesus. And through your being submissive to your own husband, may he understand and may he see God's goodness in your life so that it may turn him from his, his distracted ways to being a Christ-filled husband. A one who is not a believer to being Christ-centered in his life.
And then it says in chapter, or verse two of chapter three, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, out of your behavior, not with words, but without words. Sometimes it's not about winning the argument. Sometimes it's not about winning the debate or the discussion that you're in. Sometimes no words at all speak volumes. Jen and I are are very competitive people. Well, not very, but we're pretty competitive. When we're playing board games, it's obvious who's winning and it's obvious who's losing. She gets very quiet when things aren't going her way. I'm not a good winner. I start humming and tuning into my own little world, like, yeah, I'm winning this thing, woo! Not like last Sunday, not, no. Yeah, it does hurt, it still hurts. We're competitive, but sometimes just being quiet can speak volumes, and I know when she's being quiet because things aren't going well, and it only eggs me on. But when it comes to a debate, sometimes just being quiet is more effective than trying to get your way or trying to win the argument. And I mean that on both sides, not just for the wife, but for the husband as well. That without words, that your behavior, that when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your behavior speaks volumes. The behavior that we refer to in the first chapter of Peter and in chapter two, that you would be self-controlled, non-conforming, daily purifying yourself and deeply loving. That kind of behavior doesn't need words. It just needs to be displayed. The self-controlled attitude, the self-controlled motivations speak volumes. The being able to still love deeply even though we don't necessarily agree on this certain issue, but to still love one another deeply speaks volumes. The purity, the attitude, the lifestyles, the exclusivity to God and to your husband that you may have a pure life that displays God's goodness and redemption of who you are in him. Out of reverence, out of being set apart for God's purposes. Wife, may I encourage you to make every effort to not give your husband a reason to turn away. Make every effort to cause your husband to want to respect you and to honor you. Remember, one. Your beauty, verse three. Please hear me very clearly. You are beautiful. And that beauty is gonna change. Don't get mad at me. (laughs) But you're still beautiful. But the outward expression is not the focus here. It's the beauty inside and it says it is great worth to God. Not the way you dress, not the way you style your hair, not the jewelry you put on, none of that. That's going to fade. That's going to change. But what's inside, the work that God is doing in you is what is beautiful even more so than the outward. Now granted, I mean, if God wanted to put more hair in my head, change that beauty for the better for me, I'm I'm not going to reject that. But as he continues to do the work inside and displays the character out of the heart, the beauty that he is doing and working out to be expressed, that's God's goodness, displaying our beauty that is from him. And then Peter makes note that there's a heritage of holy women from the past 
the examples that they led of what it is to respect and to honor their husband. And he even uses Sarah and Abraham. They were old in age and had not had a son together. And God said, I'm going to bless you. And Sarah being respectful and honorable to her husband, just as her husband Abraham was respectful and honoring to God. They had their son. It was out of obedience for both of them. That God blessed them and gave them their son. Peter's desire here is to emphasize a Christ-like servant heart attitude. That when a wife and a husband are discussing things together, that it's Christ-like. That when a wife comes to her husband and out of respect for him says, I don't think we need to do this, that he listens. Speaking of husbands, just reminding you that Tuesday is Valentine's Day and it's just not for dinner. All day Tuesday is Valentine's Day. So go today, do what you got to do for Valentine's Day all day. And so maybe you are romantically challenged like me. I'm not the most romantic guy on the planet. I'm pretty sure of that. But I found a video that I think might help us guys to better understand who we are romantically challenged, but also maybe to encourage us a little bit. So let's watch this video together. So if you're romantically challenged, husbands, wake up every morning and ask yourself the question, how can I bless my wife today? Maybe it's doing the dishes. Maybe it's vacuuming the floor, sweeping the floor, cleaning the bathroom, whatever it is. Somehow you can bless your wife each and every day, even though you may not necessarily uh, like doing the dishes or whatever. When Jen and I first got married, our newlywed decision together was when she cooks, I just automatically do the dishes. There's no debate. There's no, oh, I don't want to do it. No, just that's the deal. That's the the agreement we made with one another, I just do the dishes. So I can't really be romantic by just doing a few more dishes because it's already my, my job. So here we are, chapter three, verse seven. Husbands, in the same way. Remember, we talked about that in the same way, in a Christ-like honoring servant heart manner, in the same way. Be considerate as you live with your wives. Husband, be considerate of your wife. You live with her. Being considerate means just doing something out of the normal. Considerate means putting yourself in her shoes for a moment. Sure, your day was hard. Sure, your day had many challenges. Sure, your day was filled with all kinds of crazy decisions. But think about her day. Think about what she might have done. Whether she's at home with the kids that you blessed her with, and wrangling with them or whether she's working herself. You come home together. It's, it's, it's coming to the home front and being considerate that maybe her day was tough too. I know there are days I walk into the house and I just sit down on the couch and it's like she's my psychiatrist and I just start dumping, <laughs> just like bleh. And then we play a game and I beat her in the game and no, I'm kidding. But then I have to think, wait a minute, you turkey? Did you even ask her how her day was? Like, what went on with her day? And, and so then after I gather myself back together and take my selfishness away, and then I think, oh, honey, how was your day? And then and, and we talk. And, and talking is just a really good thing, right? Communicating together is just a really good thing. Having open communication, being able to talk and, and to, to process through things together in life, that's, that's huge. So it says, husbands, be considerate of your wives as you live with your wives. Living with, that's just not a, a, a husband, you come home from a long, hard day and you want her to rub your feet and cook your supper, get you a glass of water and just make things okay. No, that's, that's not living with your wife, that's... that's your wife living for you and that's not that's not what Peter's communicating as you live with one another as you have come together because remember in Genesis the man leaves his mom and dad 
And he's married to his wife and they become one. So they live with together. And so we're as husbands to be considerate of our wives as we live with them. Because we need to understand that their lives are just as much overwhelmed with things and decisions and conversations and whatever is ours are. And then he goes on to say, with respect as the weaker partner. Weaker here, not talking about a physical attribute or even a, an ability attribute. No. Weaker meaning the partner who is actually a little more uh, vulnerable to society's cruelty. Weaker meaning the precious and cherished creation that God has placed before you. Not an inability or an inadequacy at all. I mean, there, there are obvious differences between a man and a woman. Usually the man is physically more able in some things. The woman is physically more gentle with some things. But that doesn't mean that one is inferior to the other. Just being considerate of our wives as we live with our wives and understanding that they are more vulnerable to society's cruelty because I'm here to tell you, the female has a tough job in society today. And no matter your political stance or whatever, I mean, that is just a reality. And for me as a man, I can't even understand that. I can't relate to that. And so for me to be able to be considerate of my wife and respect her and honor her speaks volumes to her. Because what does our wife need out of us as husbands? They need to have security. They need a strong man to come behind them and to support them so that they can live and live a life that is not full of fear. A lady by the name Catherine Clark Kroger, a conservative Christian theologian, her heart and mission was to help women escape and overcome abuse. And she said this statement here. How illuminating to conceive of the husband as empowering the wife to build herself up in love so that she may grow into the person that God meant for her to be. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wife. Because you are a part of building her up and encouraging her and spurring her on to be the person that God has made her to be. And if she doesn't have your support, she can't move forward. The Ephesians 5 passage that was read to us gives clear instructions for husbands. Husbands, you're the head of the wife just as Christ is the head of the church. And in verse 25, we get this definition of love from the Apostle Paul. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. In the gospel of John, we hear the words that no greater love than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. I don't know about you men, but my best buddy is my wife. And I'm here to tell you, I am absolutely without hesitation ready to lay down my life for her. If it will bless her, if it will encourage her, if it will help her to get over whatever hump that's going on in life that is pushing her back, I'm willing to give up myself for her. And in fact, when we got married, I already actually did that. Because I am no longer me, the individual, but we are a we together united. As a Christ-centered man, give every reason for her to want to respect and to honor you. Give her every reason to want to follow you wherever God is calling you to go. Moving to Iowa from Southwest Florida. She loves me. 
We were in tune together. We were talking, processing, praying together. Communication, again, I can't emphasize how important communication is together. When you are communicating together, you're able to be united. You're able to be balanced. And this isn't a relationship where the husband is lord over the wife. Absolutely not. The husband and wife are two that come together as one. Marriage is a partnership, not a dictatorship. And so when you communicate together, you're not pushing an agenda as the husband. Wife, you're not disrespecting and pushing your agenda as a wife. You are coming together to seek the Lord for a balance in what he wants for you and your marriage. You got to understand how to communicate together too. We were living in Florida. This has been about five years ago. We were sitting at a traffic light. And out of the passenger seat that where my wife was sitting comes this panicking, deep inhale. You know the one, right, guys? <gasps> I'm looking for cars to be crashing into each other. I'm looking for a ginormous alligator to be crossing the road. <laughs> I'm thinking, what is going on? And I looked at her and I go, what? They're building a Hobby Lobby across the street. <laughs> Understanding communication is vital. I'm still learning that one too. I still freak out. <laughs> Just thinking about it gives me nightmares. No, but being able to come together, there's a saying, a couple that prays together stays together. A couple that comes together and that they're open with their communication with one another. And as they come together and as they seek the Lord together, a bondage begins to happen even deeper, even stronger, an inseparable bondage. A couple that prays together stays together. Charlotte Stemple, a former Christian and Missionary Alliance missionary, said this quote, and it stuck with me for years. A life without prayer is a boast against God. I mean, you understand that? If you're not submitting yourself as a husband, as a wife, as a couple, and submitting yourself in prayer to God, you're boasting against God. God, we don't need your help right now. God, it's okay. We'll, we'll take over from here. God, we got your number. We'll give you a call if we need you. If you're not submitting yourself in prayer to the Lord as a couple, a breakdown begins to happen. A severe breakdown begins to happen. And so as a couple, as you communicate together and as you seek the Lord together, a union and the bondage in that union becomes strong. We gave Kelsey a cell phone last week. And it's only been five days. And I'm still losing hair just thinking about it. But Jen and I talked about this together. This wasn't just my idea, hey, let's just do this. This wasn't Jen's idea, like, hey, let's just do this. I mean, we wrestled through this together. We had to communicate and talk through this together. It's a big deal. To the point that I was doing research online and coming up with a contract. Jen and I came up with a contract for Kelsey to sign. <laughs> we made her initial like 20 different things. We took time to go through each thing with her, making sure she fully understood what we were saying, what we were asking, the rules that we were putting in place. And we made her understand that it wasn't about us just being mean parents. We were making her understand it was for her benefit, for her safety. But Jen and I had to come together and we had to communicate together. We had to process that together. So that we were on the same page. So that there wasn't one that was a bad guy and one that was a good guy, but that we were together unified in this. 
Communication in a marriage and a relationship is essential for the success of that relationship. As a husband and wife, you come together as one. Because in Genesis chapter 2, the man recognizes that she is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. And then the words that when a man leaves his mother and his father and he goes and he's united with his wife, the two become one. You have to be one. This is not a two people process. This is one. Marriage is singular. It's one. And the success of your marriage, of your future marriage, is dependent on communication. And again, I say to you that have, that have struggled through marriage, and maybe your marriage is struggling now, or, or maybe it's over, or maybe things are happening. I encourage you to not lose hope, not lose sight of the fact that God restores. A marriage that is broken can be healed. A marriage that has been totally demolished for you as that single mom or that single dad or living by yourself, God can restore you to a healthy marriage one day. So I pray that as you sit here and listen about a husband and a wife and the reaction and the, and the way that they are to act together as one, I pray that there's not bitterness in your heart and frustration that you're hurt. I, I get it. But know that God loves you and he wants to restore you fully. And so as we close with this verse out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Remembering in, in the reality of things that the husband and the wife are to be submissive to one another. Verse 1 says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Husband, you are the leader of your wife. And how can the wife follow if her husband is not leading in a Christ-like manner? You as the husband are to seek God daily for how you are to grow as a husband, as a father, as a man that is leading his woman, his wife. She wants to follow. You have to lead. Not in a manner that is ruling over her, but in a manner that is coming beside her. That is the gift of marriage. Working together. Processing life together. Wanting God to be the center of your marriage and of your relationship. So I pray that as you go into this week maybe consider making Valentine's Day a very special day for you and your wife maybe even for you and your family that you want Christ to be the center of everything that you do so let's stand together